Hey everyone, this is uh, John Atkinson here. I am doing another interview uh, with another individual that has uh, been involved with gen the genital autonomy movement. Uh, I've been an activist, and uh, we're here to talk about the harms of circumcision. Um, David, do you want to introduce yourself and also uh, tell the audience a little bit about how you become involved with the movement? Okay, so my name is David Marr, and a lot of people have considered me one of the more helpful and activists, and there's a reason for that. And I put all the, I am getting ahead of myself here. There's a lot of ways to answer that question. Okay, so for starters, I'm 35 years old. Well, I started in activism around age 29. And the reason I started was because somebody that was in a cat group had in their covers an Intact America meme. And I read that and I thought, Intact America, that sounds interesting. I wonder what that is. I looked at the page, read hundreds of memes, and I know a lot of people have the whole instinct of, of, um, oh, that can't be right. Oh, I'm fine. I know, you know, I was cut and I'm fine. I never really had that defense mechanism. For me, it was more, I just immediately knew it was wrong. I never had the whole needing to defend it that I see with so many cut macho guys that need to insult and belittle for even talking about it. I never had that defense mechanism. I just immediately knew that this was a messed up thing. And I knew that I'd had a couple of people reference circumcision when I was younger, but it wasn't like it didn't hit me yet. It kind of flew over my head when there might be a reference to it here and there growing up. I might have had like three references or someone referenced it and it should have clicked then, but it didn't. It just sort of flew over my head how wrong it was. And and it wasn't until the Intact America's memes and actually looking at specifics where it started to actually hit. And I thought, OK, wow, this really is wrong. And and so from there, I became a huge fan of the info memes. And I thought if, um, you know, if one meme has the power to do what it did for me, then I definitely want to be able to spread those myself. And I've always thought for, you know, activism is a very confrontational thing. And I would say that somebody who really isn't comfortable confronting it yet, I would encourage them to do one thing. And that's their featured photos at the top of the profile. I want them to put a couple of their favorite memes and just put them there. And that way it's not an aggressive. It's just if people look at your profile, they'll see it. It's not something you're actively sharing and putting in people's timelines all the time. It's just, if they look at your profile, they'll see it and it gets the conversation started. I know that's what worked for me and I know that that works for other people. It makes them think about something that they're not normally thinking about. But I did that, so age 29 on, I've actively spread as much information as I can and I make a lot of people mad every day if I'm doing my job right. It's just volunteering and you know, in a way it might be a little burnt out in some ways, but I do what I can. Not every thread is worth my time anymore, but when one of them is, I make sure to share it around or I, you know, comment on it how I can, or I send people private messages and share them on pages. And sometimes people need info memes and I'll link them to an album that has all the best info memes and it gets them started. And I do everything I can to help the beginners and know that they can just drop information and leave they don't just have to make everybody mad all the time and because <laughs> the back and forth of the conversation it gets really bad for people and they burn out and they can't yeah. do an activism and i've i've been one to encourage people to say hey you don't need to do that but you can just drop info memes and leave yeah. and just turn off yeah. notifications for threads and that's something that's not confrontational but it's getting people's attention and the smart people are listening is the thing mm -hmm. yeah. So just to be clear with the audience, you are a victim yourself? Yeah, I restore it also as well. Okay, great, interesting. So uh, I have this list of things I like to go through with the interviews um, and the very first major section of the list is to identify the physical harms of this procedure. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of guys say, well, what's the harm? How does it hurt? How is it bad or whatever? So, Part of uh, I've created some videos on YouTube that try to outline the harms using my mock penis made out of yarn. Um, but I wanted to go a little bit further and, and actually interview people like you, um, so people see that it's not just me that's saying this. That there are plenty of men and women out there that know the harm firsthand. So uh, the first uh, first item that I cover under the physical um, harm is I use the use a word that's called acropostion. I think you know what that means, um, but uh, 
and John Geisker covered it in one of the presentations. He did this on my YouTube channel. Uh, you know, he took a, he had an image of a, I think it's a Roman or Greek sca statue that showed a man intact and he had the little part past the, past the glands. You know, he had, he was a fully intact uh, male. And, um, and the idea is that it used to be that they only cut off the part that was in front of the glands. They didn't cut off everything covering the glands. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming, I, from my understanding, you would cut more than that, right? I have always said that if I was cut any more, I would have had painful erections every day. Wow. They left really just enough. And com in comparison to others, I was actually cut very tight. Okay. And actually, they don't have my medical record saying who did it. Yeah. So it's just missing off the medical records, which leads me to think it might have been a student doctor or something else. Because they don't even say who. All the vaccinations are there, but there's no record on who did the cutting. And I was left with a shit job where, you know, it's a perfect circle, but they didn't really leave anything at all. It was like any more removed, I would have been in pain every day. There's no maybe about it. Yeah. So in a way, I feel fortunate that not more was removed, but why the hell didn't they leave a little more also? I mean, that's there's people that are cut really loose and they have it good and lucky, and I'm, I'm not one of those, but... A tight cut. Okay, so how long did it? Uh, you, you said you're fully restored. How many months or years did you take to get? I don't know if you'd call it fully restored. Fully restored is maybe a matter of opinion. I would say I'm as restored as I want to be, but you might think that I could do more. But I went from, I did probably around three years every day, and I wore the MP Restore between 45 minutes and an hour, just sitting a day and give it ten gentle tension. And you know, the first couple months are slow and then it started getting really rapid. Like people were shocked at how much progress I was making after that. I mean, I don't do pictures, but just from explanation, you know, but, and um, really woke up my body. Like it just suddenly needed like a million orgasms like left and right. And that's the thing that people say about is that it makes buried nerves mobile. And especially in the case of me with a tight cut, there was probably a ton of buried nerves that just needed to wake up because I was starting to have a lot of trouble with all of that. And then suddenly it just woke up like nobody's business. And, and then, all right, is he? That's my son, my youngest son, sorry. Okay, well, anyway, the, it made buried nerves mobile and it, it did a lot of improvement, a ton of improvement and, and, I was very, I was very grateful for the help with MP Restore, and I, I would want to recommend it to others, but I understand that he's not making them right now. Yeah, not too bad. I didn't know about that. So, you, how many, how long did you say you spent? To about three years restoring. Three years. About three years restoring, and it got to a point where it got overly buried, and it was like, okay, I think that that's the point where I just want to stop. You know, I'm not yeah. trying to. I'm not trying to look buried. I'm trying to, the, that got, you eventually can get to a point where you can do a surgery to tighten it up. And I was probably reaching around that point mm -hmm. and it got to the point where I felt like I was looking too buried and I, it started to make me self-conscious and I just thought, okay, I think that's my stopping point. Mm -hmm. And that might not be everybody's final stopping point, but for me, I felt like it was looking kind of strange. And so I stopped for a while and let it kind of go a little closer to normal. And I haven't, I haven't done it since. I don't even know where it is right now. It's in my stuff somewhere. I moved, so, but I don't really want to do it anymore either. Yeah. So I haven't done the the manhood and the retaining. I did manhood a little bit, and it actually did really help. But they like didn't fit me anymore, and I didn't want to buy another one. Yeah. So, but it it was helpful doing just making it that the glands are more sensitive and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the audience, the manhood is something that. Um, keeps it, it covers the glands and keeps it covered uh, so it, uh, it becomes moist and smooth again. So something you can buy online. Maybe I'll find the link to it and put it in the um, in the description of the video. So uh, the next uh, item is sensitive skin, and uh, this is just to clarify to everyone that watches that yes it is sensitive skin and you, you and i often see people say oh it's just a flap of skin or flap of useless skin or whatever it's 
it's so much more than that. It's, it's skin that is highly innovated and highly vascularized, right? I just consider it their pleasure center, and I'll always refer to it as the pleasure center. And then if people don't understand that, there's uh, maybe three to five info memes I can post that even only just begin to explain what it is. It doesn't even really explain it all the way. It just sort of touches the surface on all the different parts and all the different things that it is. And if people still don't get it at that point, then they're just a moron wanting to just call it skin. But I'll at least try to yeah. post the material if I can, if it gets to that. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, and it does protect the glands. And since you've done some restoration, you have some experience about how it does cover and protect the glands, right? Yeah. And how important that is for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and since you've done some restoration, now you have a little bit of a rolling mechanism, right? It's not just a flap of skin that lays there that, you know, falls down or whatever. It, it unrolls as the penis becomes erect. I mean, it's not like what I would call a normal foreskin. It's, I notice when I'm standing that it looks like I'm intact. And then other times it's more separated and going further back. It just does whatever it does. It's not yeah. going to always be in the same position all the time. But I do know a number of times I'm standing up and notice in a mirror that it looks to be intact. And that to me is a, a reward and a victory. But then other times I'm going to look and it's going to be, you know, not in that position. But it's looser skin than what it normally would be. But it's closer to the real thing. And it, it brings back the gliding mechanism. It brings back so it brings more views in many different ways and a lot more feeling a lot i mean there's people who will you know bunch the skin over the glands and like tape it up and that way they can increase sensitivity which i haven't done it maybe i should but once you have enough to work with you can do that and bring a lot of the sensitivity back and it's compared to you know if you keep your tongue out it's going to dry out it's the same with the gland <laughs> going to be able to cover it up that's one of the my it's images that I hope meant up. to be an internal organ, and it's not because people were stupid and cut their voice. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and I think most everyone knows uh, everyone that's had some sex ed or whatever knows that you know the, the penis is variable. It you know depends on many variables like the temperature or whatever. You know, you, you might be more or less flaccid at any particular particular time. So it makes sense that you, you may have more or less coverage at any moment of the day. Okay, moisture and uh, or slash lube lubrication. So um, with the covered glands, uh, things aren't dried out and there it's, it's actually- I've never needed lube. No? I've never used lube. I know a lot of cut men are routinely using lube every day, but I've never done it. I never have. And with restoring, there's even less of a need to than before. Yeah. It just has all the feeling and all the mechanics it's supposed to have. But I've never had a need for lube and I have even less need for it now. Great. Uh, for any of them, uh, do you know, I mean, <clears throat> there, there's different kinds of cuts. There's the Mogan clamp, Gumco clamp, Bastabelle. I saw there's a there's zero. What's There's that? zero way I had any frenulum left. Really? Wow. So like they cut out the frenulum underneath your your glands. There's zero way that there would be any frenulum left. Not even a piece of it. Really? Wow. Tight cut. Yeah. I got unlucky with that. I wish they had at least left a piece of it, but they didn't. There's no way. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. And I've seen on well, if there's like a dark part of it like a little bit of a dark part of it, that could mean that there's a piece of the frenulum left mm -hmm. and it's not like that. It's just smooth all the way over and just a low down scar. So I don't think there's any left. It just wouldn't be possible with how low they cut. Okay. All right. Uh, the ridge band, that's the part, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, the part that goes from the it's kind of like your left. It tethers side. it up. Are you talking about? It? It's sort of like a rope that tethers it. Um, well, I guess it's, it's like a, a good, it's around the end of the of the um, prepuce normally uh, with an yeah. intact man, and it's the part kind of like the lips where you go from the inter intermucosal part to the 
external skin part. Yeah. And I've heard various stories about what it does and how it works. I've heard that like when when the penis is becoming erect and and um, the prepuce is unrolling down the penis and the um, red band is stretching out that that um, does multiple things and has certain sensations in them. I don't know how well I don't I haven't seen a whole lot of studies that really investigate the the red band in detail. Have you? Have I? Yeah. I have read many many things, but it's been a while and. It can be depressing reading it too closely because I know I don't have it. Yeah, I would rather drop the info and leave honestly because it's like, what am I going to do about it? I can't get it back. Yeah, I would do a surgery to do a what do you call it? An implant surgery. Sometimes people want to get cut as an adult, and I could do something <laughs> like that. But that's that'd be if I had like an extra eight thousand dollars, which I don't right now. So <laughs> yeah. that's not. I don't know if that'll ever be possible, but I would do it. I would definitely consider it. Wow. Well. That would be, that'd be interesting to see a story about a man that's something like that. Well, I think that's the closest we can get to to actually doing it. There's people that have taken like skin from their butt and like done some kind of surgery with it that way, and that's been successful. And there's people that have done um, surgeries with an implant that have gone cut to, and that, that I guess is supposed to be successful. And that might be the closest thing I could do to being intact again, and if I ever have that kind of money. But I don't believe fortune's a real thing. I've always thought that seemed really scammy and mm -hmm. and is probably the best I can do if I ever go that route. Yeah, so for the audience, Forgen is a company that is supposedly trying to come up with a way to replace the, the male prep use for men that uh, have been repeatedly amputated. It comes up a lot. It comes up a lot with people saying, oh, I have so much hope for Forgen and you know, well, let's do that someday. But then people will speak up and be like, there's really no evidence that they've gone further in what they've done. They take everyone's money, but they don't really have any proof of what they're doing. And huh. I, it's one of those things. I mean, I, I don't like taking people's hope away. But for me, I'll believe it when I see it. And I don't get a good feeling from it. Okay. Uh, so one of the um, impacts of missing your prep use is uh, hairy shaft, uh, yeah. brutal webbing. Is that something that you've experienced? Not webbing. I, I'm not super clear on what webbing is, but I don't think I have that. But hairy shaft is something that really all cut men I've talked to say they've experienced. It's just a lot of cut men just thought that was always normal, but it's really not. It's because, yeah. you know, they were cut and it goes higher. But yeah, yeah I, it's just well, um, you know, I, I don't know, it's really hairy shaft. I mean, you got your, your shaft skin, right? Um, I have like maybe about that much. Um, and when my penis becomes erect, it, it, instead of pulling down on my prep piece that I don't have, is pulling up on my scrotum. So that scrotum gets up onto my shaft, and the scrotum, you know, as a man, is hairy. So that's, I feel like I have scrotal webbing slash hairy shaft. I, I understand some men, you know, end up growing hair, you know, on their shaft directly, but uh, I'm talking more about the scrotal webbing kind of hairy shaft. Uh, and because of scrotal webbing, because the scrotum is being drawn up onto the penis during an erection, um, that can end up affecting the testes. Uh, I've seen men where the testes come up and they, they end up on both sides of the, of the of the shaft of the penis. And for myself, at least when I was younger, I'm 50 now, so I screwed them and stretched out, but um, it would pull my, my testes up so tight that one of them would end up being pushed into my body and I'd have to stop sexual activity or whatever until I could relax my, um, my penis a little bit and get it back out of my body. Do you have any kind of experiences with that? About getting my balls back in my scrotum, about which part of it? Well, um, having having your testes get squished at all in, in any way, or being drawn up and, and having discomfort with your testes. Uh, you know, it's it's not quite as far as like getting kicked in the nuts, but um, but you know, having a little. Bit I don't of think I experienced nuts. that. No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. 
Hi, uh, pelvic floor. Uh, for for me, that means that uh, when I when I become erect, that's I should have left that out there. Um, and you know the the the, inner, the corpus cavernosum, you know, in, inside is filling up blood, right? And you, you becoming erect, and your your penis is, is coming away from your body. The, if the skin is too tight, going to you know at the top of your penis that goes to your the lower part of your stomach, the pelvic floor. Um, the penis can draw upward like that, kind of like a crane, you know, pulling up on the, the arm of the crane. Any experiences with that? No. Okay. Uh, Meatal stenosis. Did you experience that as a child? No. No. Okay. Meatal stenosis. Oh. Pain in the end of the penis hole, right? No, I didn't. Yeah. No. No. Okay. Uh, skin bridges. Any experiences with that? Nope. Um, erectile dysfunction. That restoring had to help. Right. Age twenty-five to twenty-nine, doctors were zero help at all, and eventually, I found an activist, and they sent me straight with that. Oh. Oh. But I think that that's part of the risk of getting cut in the first place, but especially getting a tight cut. Yeah. You don't really have a lot of nerves and vessels left over. And that's something that it's important to address that a lot of cut men will claim, oh, I don't have any trouble, I don't have any trouble, whatever, and just insist on doing it to their kid. But you talk to these wives in private groups, and a lot of them are saying their husband actually has a lot of trouble. So it depends who you ask and who you're talking to. But men usually won't admit that about themselves. But their wife might is the thing if you talk to other people. I don't think that it's really as uncommon as people think that it is. The more people we've spoken to about it. But I did do restoring and it made things significantly better in no time at all. It's just that the buried nerves maybe got too buried and they weren't wanting to function right anymore or something mm -hmm. and doctors were zero help and didn't just told me stupid things oh it's not normal for your age or whatever and i didn't really get any help until an activist sort of sent me on my way and i start i got the device and okay. well that's interesting uh, so, I mean, that's that's proof that it it definitely has an effect by not having your everything, all your parts. Um, and it's it a world of difference. It's such a big, big world of difference. And I've always said if cut men realized how much of a difference, they'd yeah. all be doing it. But it's just hard to get anyone to think that they should start, I guess. But for me, it was just obvious. But for others, it, it's really hard to get them to that point or to be regular about it. Yeah. And it's, it's hard because, like, we experience a lot of anger at the beginning that we even have to do it in the first place mm -hmm. and we might be raging towards our parents for months just thinking yeah. you know why in the heck do i even have to wear this it's so stupid that they even cut me mm -hmm. and we might have a lot of turmoil for a while when we're starting the restoring and that's not uncommon i've talked to a lot of men that have restored and a lot of them go through a huge period of anger at the beginning. Yeah. I said a lot of really not nice things to my inactivism during that time. I made a lot of parents very upset. I was very blunt and rude with how I talked for at least a good three months, probably. I was probably on everybody's list of inactivists they didn't like. Yeah. For, for the cutter parents, anyway, I'm not talking about the inactivists, but there wasn't much of me that wanted to be nice for a while. I'll put it that way. Yeah. I've I've scaled back significantly since then, but I didn't really have a huge tolerance to want to be nice to cutters at that time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's that uncommon and it also can help us kind of work through it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it seems to me very common to uh, the male victims are either very angry and very um, verbally out there or they just hide. Um, I, I've gone to norm meetings, National Organization of Restoring meetings, and there's plenty of men that you know they all restore but they they don't speak out so yeah um okay so and erectile dysfunction it, it's also you know caused psychologically so you know my my view is that not only is it a fact that you're missing 
part of your genitalia uh, and effects, but the fact that you know that you're missing something or the more that you've learned about the harm, the more your, your brain is going to cause you to have erectile dysfunction as well. Uh, any general botches, you know, like uh, curved penises because you were cut crooked or anything like that? No, no? not like that. Okay. All right, uh, the next major section is about um, partners and how uh, things are harmed um, physically with, with partners. Um, like, for instance, I've had cases where my partner would get torn because there wasn't enough lubrication there and we'd get too excited and uh, jump into things a bit too fast. Uh, how about you? You're talking about premature ejaculation? I don't have that. No, no. Um, how how are your partner, your sexual partners affected by the fact that, uh, or were they affected um, before you restored? It was a huge improvement. And aside from that, I don't think he wants me talking about his side of it. Okay. But he, he definitely has seen an improvement. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's three sections uh, that I've got, you know, the partnership side broken into. And there's the heterosexual part. Um, there's anal, which can be both um, homosexual and, or heterosexual. And then there's um, something that's specific to homosexuals, and that's docking. Um, and in order for docking to work, uh, at least one of the males has to have their crypties. Otherwise, it's kind of like just crossing swords. <laughs> Okay, the next section is psychological. Uh, and the first part, obviously, is the trauma from getting cut itself, the actual procedure. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how you, you might have been traumatized when you were? I have a lot of thoughts about it. I, so here's the thing is a lot of people will, not that I believe anything that cutters say, but cutters like to act like, oh, we're such a close family. Oh, they're totally healthy. It's no big problem. I can tell you firsthand from my own self that even at a very young age, I felt a very big lack of trust with my family. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I couldn't trust my parents and I didn't really know why. And I felt like I hated mom for unknown reasons. There was something that was leering in my head. And I firmly believe that's actually from being cut. And I didn't know what it was at that time. And then I know that from my own experience, I see photos, videos of families that are intact, and they obviously are much closer as a family. And Cutter families deny that, but I've seen it time and time again with my own life. I see intact families, and they look much closer as a family. And then I see Cutter families, and they look like so much emotional distance is between them. And I've seen that with my own family, too. It, I don't think that my family is what I would consider a cutter family. And yes, there was emotional distance between us. And I don't really think that you can be a cutter family and then also be completely family oriented. Mm -hmm. I think that they made they treated their kids like dolls and jack lanterns and pumpkins and playthings, and they didn't treat them as their own human with their own human rights. And they thought that they're more important as parents that they get to decide, decide that kind of thing. And that it's a horrid lack of personal boundaries to even consider that that kind of thing is normal. It's not normal. Yeah. And if someone's tricked and duped into it, then all you can do is profusely apologize and offer to buy any restoring gear. And that's all you can do is not make the wedge in the family any bigger than it already is. I, unfortunately, at that point, that's the best we can do. But try not to let the cycle continue with their own kids and let them know that this is a horrible mistake. And we did what we believed we were right at the time, believed our doctor. But you don't let them think that this is okay either. It wasn't okay. And I wish like crazy I talked to my mom about it before she passed. She got a brain tumor and passed uh, 10 years ago. And we never had a conversation about it. And I regret that because I didn't know what I need to know about it. And dad, I asked about it and he had no memory. The doctor did it. They never knew and no complications as far as he knew. And that was all I really wanted to ask about it because I didn't really want to know more at that point. Because if he doesn't even know what doctor did it, 
that's a very sore thing for me. That's just ridiculous. If I was stupid enough to do it, I would find the best doctor to do it. And that's where I stand. My family and I haven't talked about it. They do know that I'm an activist. They can't not know that with what's on the top of my profile, with the info memes, with all the different times I've talked about it on my Facebook. There's no way for them not to know, but it's not been a conversation. My family is very evasive. And that's another part of, I think, the psychological trauma is just they're very evasive as people. They don't come to me and say, hey, David, it's weird that you're talking about this or learn. They would rather just never have the conversation. And they've always been family i want to handle things head on and find solutions and make change they were conversation for decades and decades and never had that conversation but that's their way of dealing with life and i'm not an evasive person like that i can't live that way yeah uh so you know you you made me think about uh i don't know if you've seen this book yet it shows up there on the screen circumcision's car by uh jay jackson Uh, he has similar stories to you and I. So let's jump from the cut. Um, as you were learning about the harms, the loss, your losses, um, do you feel that you were traumatized? Did you go through some sort of trauma? I think that I was confused and getting information and affected and all of that. But I think that the moment that I really felt very angry was when I found out that intact men couldn't have sex over and over and over throughout the day and not stop. And that's when it 100% hit me what I'd lost. And for cut men, I don't believe that that's normal. I don't think it is not with the men that I know and they might say that they can, but I don't think many of them actually can not with the experience that I've had intact men can have sex over and over throughout the day because they're designed to have all their parts, but cut men. I just, I don't see it, but maybe it's possible with some of them. I not with the people I've been with and I've not been shy about being sexually active either. So never with any that I've been with can just go and just do another one. Yeah. It's. I don't think that that's very common, not with anybody that I've been with. But um, I read that I read about people's experience of women were talking about with their intact husband and how they can just go over and over throughout the day, and that's when it hit me: is wow, I really lost something significant. I would really like to have done that. I'd yeah. like to be able to do that and perform that way. And for me, you know, once a day is, is good. And I don't know that I can really do better than that. I can definitely and thoroughly enjoy it once a day, but all throughout the day, forget it. I don't think that I'm, I'm equipped that way anatomically. I don't think that it even works that way. It doesn't, I feel like I can be even, I think on my best days, I'm thinking maybe two or three times, but that's, that's probably like time in between. And maybe not even that, you know. I might be good once a day, maybe twice. Definitely not all day long. And that's when it hit me how bad it really was. And it took me a while to work through my anger about that. It hit me all at once. Wow, this is really messed up that my parents did that. And the full weight of what they did seemed to hit with that one. Talking to women with their intact husbands. It's one of those things, the more we learn, the worse it gets. And sometimes we got to be careful what information we read. We may not be ready for that information yet. And it's not, we can very well read something and be shocked by what we should have been able to keep. And it, it might make us really upset if we're surprised by what we could have had. Yeah, we just need to be careful what information we're we're ready to read at that time. Yeah. So you know about the five stages of grief, right? A little bit. Yeah. So it sounds like you get through the grief or the the um, denial part of grief real fast. <laughs> but to me, it was just obvious how wrong it was when I read about it. I didn't. Well, why cut off healthy parts of someone? You need to have. I liked Jonathan Conte's quote in the in American Circumcision documentary was 
I think it was him that said it right that with big claims we need big proof and I've always felt that way. I mean, you're gonna. That wasn't him that said that. No, that wasn't Jonathan. No, I'm that wasn't Jonathan. Right. Which person said that? Oh, I think it was the doctor, uh, the radio doctor that said that. I'm forgetting his name right now, but he did. He did. I don't have to watch it again. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I mean, even without watching it, even without knowing that quote, I think that's something that I always innately felt, though, is you're gonna claim that healthy parts need to be cut off well where's your proof and do we really have good proof for that because look around we see that so much of the world isn't doing it and what makes it so that it's only americans that have defective penises Mm -hmm. and it never really had the denial for me i just read about it and thought oh wow this is messed up and then the more i read is oh it's even more messed up oh it's even more messed up and we start realizing about the complications the deaths the the men that have daily pain because of it and and then there's more than that. There's the psychological. There's families that are destroyed from it. There's yeah. the the moms that will never stop hating their husbands because the husband wanted it and the and the mom didn't. And it's mm-hmm. completely destroys families when we read yeah. about the different experiences with parenting. It's more than just the physical. Yeah. It's yeah. like the it's a horrible cycle of abuse and pain that just gets bigger and bigger as a problem the more we look. Yeah, and we, but, we get into some of that uh, with the relationship section of this, too. Um, huh, okay. Um, so it definitely sounds like you're traumatized by the discovery. Uh, the next section is suicide. Did, have you experienced um, people feeling suicide, or have you even had suicidal thoughts yourself after learning about the harms? I don't no, I never got that far. Big anger. Big anger towards cutter parents and my own parents for sure, but never that far. Okay. Even maybe a little depressed, but it was more angry than depressed, I think. It never suicidal. Okay. I do believe that if I was one that would have daily pain, it probably would have gotten there. But I'm not one that has daily pain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as an activist, we heard several stories, right, about guys that have committed suicide. Jonathan Conte being one of the most uh, well-known ones because he was also a very avid uh, advocate for genital autonomy. Uh, The psychological effects of children. I I don't imagine you have any children. No, that's not in the cards for us at this time. Yeah. Um, Do you have any thoughts about uh, how this impacts children? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's not... I could be, you know, the villain of so many Cutter families for it, but I firmly believe that, you know, you... So many Cutter parents... Parent choice, I just wanted to do it. And I just did it because I feel like it... You know, you, you're not his parents, so you have no say, and just be as obnoxious as possible. But if I turn it around and say... Okay, so when your kid is three, I'm going to call on the phone. I'm going to explain to them what you did. They Their tune changes to that I'm just this big pervert, that how dare I even suggest that. You know, They seem so proud of what they've done, but they don't intend to have a real conversation with them about it either. And I, if I could, I would make sure all those kids knew what was done to them. Hell, I would be willing to protest right outside of schools, but I can't because I'm in a small town. My manager would get really upset with me about that well there's things that i can't do in a small town is the reality which is one of the reasons that i want to do online and activism because i can do that anywhere but when it comes to me protesting outside of hospitals i'm sorry i just can't not i would become an enemy of everybody in my small town if i did something like that yeah i can't not living where i live anyway i'd have to be driving much further away i have done the bloodstained men protests though and I would, I'd done two of those and would do more, but I, I haven't been able to do more. I don't know what the other group is, the cockfighters. I, I almost could have done one of those ones. I wish I could have done it. I would like to do maybe more of them with the blood stand and kind of branch out more. Okay. Um, have you ever considered like just calling your local hospital or something and just complaining to them and just say, hey, you know, I, I think what you guys are doing is horrible? Well, it's in Los Angeles and I'm in Arkansas. The best I could do now is maybe oh. Yelp review. I can do that. 
Oh, no, I'm, I'm talking about like in Arkansas where you live. You kind of, you know, you're in a small town, but there is there a hospital there in your town? Yeah, there's hospitals here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You and, I these... know of a, uh, and I know of at least two doctors that are actually against the practice here. Oh. I think that it's move, moving that way, even though it is a small town, even though it is Arkansas. It's, there's doctors that are adamantly against it, even here. I think Arkansas isn't as bad as some places like Idaho, Ohio. I meant mm-hmm. to say Ohio. Um, they're just ridiculous. Any parents I've talked to her, but here I think it's pretty known by at least some of the population that it's wrong. But there are places that are worse than Arkansas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so a medical professionals is the next psychological aspect. Uh, you're not uh, a medical professional yourself? No. No, I'm a uh, massage therapist. Okay. Uh, parents, um, you're not a parent. Um, no. Uh, and you're not an intact man, so that pretty well covers the whole psychological aspect of this. Unless you have any other thoughts on the psychological impacts of, you know, the fact that uh, in the culture there's this general cutting thing going on. I, is, is this a question? I don't understand. Do you have any any other thoughts about the psychological impacts to people um, in any shape form, or, or form? Just Absolutely. Because... I feel like my relationship with my parents is destroyed. I don't see. I mean, for me, it's I feel like I can forgive my family for their denial of my autism all throughout my life. I can forgive them for, you know, being all horrible with coming out as gay and tricking me into an anti-gay seminar and forcing me to finish a year of school where I was harassed all year long. And every horrible mistake I did was traumatizing. And, but even all of that, I feel like I can forgive them for, but cutting me, no way. Like you're a freaking moron. And not only that, but like maybe if my two little brothers had been left intact and they realized it was wrong, that would have gone like a long way towards healing, but they cut off four boys and I have no respect and no sympathy for that. Wow. Uh, to me, those are monsters and I don't have any respect for a parent that would do that. I would have respect for someone that say maybe did it once and then realized how wrong it was and didn't do it again. I understand yeah. somebody more, more on that side of it, but not someone that would cut off four boys. If you cut off four boys, I think you're a freaking moron. I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. And if there was any chance of just healing my relationship with my family, I think that when I realized the full extent of what they'd done with cutting, there was just no more chance of that. I can't forgive anybody that would do something like that. I just can't. Mm-hmm. I don't have it. In, I don't have it in me to say that something like that is okay enough to want to talk to that person again. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I would want to spend time around somebody like that. And that can make me just the most, a whole unforgiving person on the planet to a lot of people, but I know my own sense of boundaries, morality, and that to me is no friend or family of mine. I, I can't be around somebody like that unless they are groveling for forgiveness. And there's no way that I'm going to get that kind of thing from dad. So for me, it's not only a psychologically harmful thing, but I feel like it's destroyed my relationship with my family. I, there's really no coming back from that. If like, so, There's a lot of parents that'll say, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize how wrong it was. But there's the other side too, and parents that will never admit how wrong it was. Yeah. And if parents aren't accountable and they're not the apologizing type, there may not be any getting over that fracture in that relationship. And for me, I'm not really comfortable talking about it with dad in the first place. And even if I did, then what would I get? That he's not the apologizing type. So there's really not much point in having that kind of a conversation. So there's not only the psychological and what is done to mess up my head and work through the anger about that, but there's the other end of the psychological, you really may not want to be around your family again. I feel like I'm thousands of miles away. And if I ever saw that again, it would be too soon. And that's the primary reason I can't be comfortable around someone who would make that kind of a decision. So there's people that have big feelings about what was done to them and they may not have it in them to forgive someone. And the only way that they could is if they were apologetic and they may not be. So what do you even do with something like that? All I can do is just 
try to adapt and, and solve it on my own. But, you know, mm-hmm. if people beg me to go somewhere, then maybe I'd have to have the conversation with them of, you know, I, I'm really not comfortable around someone that would do something like that and just really lay it down and, and be open about it. Cause here I am, I've done trips because, you know, my dad wanted me to, my brothers wanted me to, my sister wanted me to, but when was the last time I actually saw them because I wanted to. And that's really the primary reason that goes through my head. It's like, am I even really comfortable around these people? Would I even really want to see my dad if someone wasn't pulling my arm to do that? And it's just really hit me the last few years. Like, well, maybe I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> like maybe that's just something other people want me to do. And that's not something that I would normally do on my own. It is not that he's necessarily a bad guy, but how do you forgive someone for doing something like that? And I can't keep doing things because other people want me to do it. I need to be more authentic in myself and what my own feelings are. And my own feelings are, I wouldn't spend time around somebody like that. Mm-hmm. I would never be comfortable spending time around somebody like that. And that's the honest truth of that is that's not something that I find forgivable. Yeah. So I think, as you know, um, I myself came this close to becoming a regret parent myself. So I don't, uh, I don't know, imagine it gives you any consolation, but you know, and if I was your dad, I'd feel horrible about what I allowed to happen to you. Well, for someone that feels horrible, I mean, if, if he did feel horrible, he's not made that known to me with info yeah. memes on the top of my Facebook and tons of different posts about it. I haven't heard word yeah. one of, oh, yeah, if we knew more, we wouldn't have done it. And there's yeah. never been any reaching out like that. And I don't really want to reach out and ask myself. So yeah. it's not a comfortable conversation to have. And I don't think I'm going to get the acknowledgement from it. If they've never been the apologizing type my entire life, then I don't expect them to start now. Yeah, I hear you. <sighs> okay, so uh, uh, that kind of already covers this next section about relationships, uh, child-parent trust. Uh, it doesn't sound like you have a, have a lot of trust for your parents since they chose to, not just to do it to you, but they chose to do it to your brothers. And I uh, haven't... Um, haven't learned the uh, how it's harmful themselves and uh, apologize in any way. Uh, you're not a parent yourself, so the co-parenting relationship sections don't really relate to you. Um, I've co-parented. All right. What do you? What would you have asked about that? Well, um, so we raised two boys quite a bit on oh. our own. I mean, well, I mean, it is co-parenting. But they yeah. were passed back and forth to us many, many times. Oh, okay. But we're, they're no longer in our lives, but they were for years. Is yeah. there a couple? If you could just ask, maybe. Well, some... So, I mean, some people end up getting divorced over this issue, right? One way or another. Yeah. Um, because one wants to cut and the other one does not. Um, so, and you, you covered it earlier about, um, about Adam's this. against the practice. Fortunately, it didn't take a whole lot of convincing. He started um, reading stuff I was posting and on his own seemed to realize how wrong it was. So should we have a son, that's not going to be an issue. And I'm glad. But the more he read about things that I was posting on and stuff, he came to his own conclusion about how wrong it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't even really have to convince him myself because he just was reading stuff as I was commenting on things. Yeah. It doesn't sound like there was any kind of stress at all about because of this topic in, in, in your relationship as a parent. Is there stress in this topic? I between you I and between stress. you and, and the other parent. It depends what you mean by stress. What do you mean by stress? So typically what this what I run into is when you have one once got one doesn't and then there's that's a that's a stress when the when one is trying to convince the other to or not to do so. So it's it's you know, it's like a fight or whatever. It doesn't sound like you guys fought or you your partner um, was easily convinced just by looking at uh, researching himself. Yeah, we're both against the practice. Fortunately, that wasn't hard to come to that. Okay. All right. Um, the next section is mother-child bond. Uh, and the, the thinking here is that the 
child needs to be needs to bond with the mother um, after birth for a certain amount of time, um, preferably like skin to skin contact, um, breastfeeding, and all all of that. And the idea that the child is taken away from the mother to have part of its genitalia cut off and then brought back, you know, in a traumatized state or whatever, um, it, it kind of breaks that bond. Any thoughts on that? I never felt as connected to mom as I should have felt. And I think there's absolutely truth to that. Okay. I mean, I guess I, I was a mama's boy and I was sensitive and all those other things, but I never felt as close to mom as I felt like I should have felt. And I think that even at a young age, I was realizing that they weren't accountable people and it took a long time to get them to do anything. They did what was convenient for them and not what was necessary to do. Yeah. But so from a young age, I felt like I, there was a big lack of connection with my family and my mom, my dad. And I was kind of glad that there was because if there wasn't my rough coming out, I probably would have just ended up killing myself. But there was a lot of disconnect before that. So I really didn't give a crap what they thought of me very much. They, there was a big need to emotionally disconnect my family much earlier. And that's what kind of saved me in some of my later turmoil years. It would have been a lot worse if I was really caring what they thought of me when they're tricking me into an anti-gay seminar and all of that. And yeah. I was just like, yeah. these people are morons. Like I wasn't taking it all super personally, but I mean, I was angry with them and I hated them, but I wasn't like, oh, I need to be straight for them. You know, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah. wasn't so, like that. So it sounds like your, your parents are homophobic. My parents had a book, um, Parents' Guide to Preventing Homosexuality, on their bookshelf, among other books. Yeah. They, they tricked me into going to Love One Out. You can look up Love One Out. There was an anti-gay seminar that tried to make you do the Christian path of being straight. Mm -hmm. They have since disbanded and apologized publicly, but I was actually tricked into attending that seminar, just being told it was an educational seminar. By the way, I was tricked into this while I was being harassed at school all year, all day long. And in the middle of that, my parents thought it was a good idea to trick me into going to this and force me to finish that year of school. So it was a lot all at once. There wasn't, there wasn't really a concern that David's going to kill himself. It was more, how do we make him be straight? Their yeah. priorities were all fudged up and in the wrong place. But I think that, you know, if, you're a messed up enough Christian, you may think you're doing all that out of love, but that isn't love at all. Oh. It is ridiculously controlling and just mind bending and brainwashing. And it's not a normal or healthy or loving way to act whatsoever. But I maintain that when you're pregnant, that's when you need to make peace of the fact that your kid may not be straight and accept whatever they are after that. But some people are just bent on thinking that, their kid will be straight, and then when they're not, they become very evil, ugly people. Sorry, I went through that. Okay. Um, do, you, do you have any? Do you know of any details about um, your birth and uh, how soon you were cut and all that? Well, I thought that my colic might be related to it, but that's one of the things that confirmed my dad that my colic was actually a couple of months later. Okay. I thought that my colic, because I, I cried for three months straight, I guess, as a baby. But I guess that wasn't related to the cutting. That, that was like a couple months down the road. So I cut my parents up a, long, a lot for a couple months. And then besides that, my I was a quick, easy delivery. I was like in labor for like two hours. I don't really know anything about the cutting or how that went. Something my mom would know better, and she's passed from brain tumor. She probably was doing the diaper changes more than dad. So I can't really get more information on that. Okay. It's possible I was really fussy and bad at the time. I, I wouldn't have that information. Okay. All right. Um, the next section on relationships is uh, about pedophilia. Um, there's a lot of thoughts, correlations between this, um, about be between general cutting in general, not just, uh, not just males 
and uh, and how it may cause or how it's related to pedophilia. Have you had any thoughts about that yourself? About what being related to pedophilia? Uh, general cutting. General cutting, of not just males, but females too. Maybe even intersex. The people that are into it might be correlated to pedophilia? Yeah, I mean, that one of the ideas is that uh, that cut men are attracted to younger um, younger women, um, younger females, um, because, well, here, I'll, I'll give you my example. So, you know, cut males are missing like half of their um, sensitive skin. So they don't have a whole lot of sensitive skin left. And uh, in order to get to and uh, get completed, they, they need things like pressure. Um, you know, some women will do Kegels in order to be able to um, squeeze more on the male's penis, for instance. And the thinking is that, well, younger women have tighter vaginas. Um, and so, and maybe cut men maybe need that more often. I haven't seen any studies of this or anything. It's just uh, theory. It's just what we lost. You said theory, theory, theory. Yeah, it's a theory. Well, that's something that I've thought about too, but I don't know that it's quite what you're asking. I know that um, Brandon, who made American Circumcision, was getting messages from people wanting to know about the cutting procedure and what was shown in the film mm -hmm. and all these weird, screwy questions, but wouldn't really say why they needed to know it. And I definitely feel like there's an element to it with that and the disgusting comments that they make when they, they do it and they talk about the size of kids. And I mean, I've read enough about what doctors say and do to know how sick it is and the mentality of it and how there's definitely suspicious things about it that I don't think that like a, a sane, normal person would say unless there's an element of that with it. But I don't know that that's really what you're asking. No, that, that, that's another another aspect, another view on uh, on how this is connected to pedophilia. I've even heard of stories about nurses saying that the doctor that was performing the procedure would get a hard on, um, you know, get an erection during the the cutting. Yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah. There's so many different aspects to look at with that, and there's a whole. When people can stomach reading a lot about an activism, there's a very sick side of it that people can look at. Not, you know, that we would look sick, but that, that the cutters would look sick. And the kinds of pleasure they get from doing it is really disgusting if we want to look into that. And there's definitely a lot of links to it. And I think a lot about Brian Morris is absolutely the creepiest person on the planet to me. <laughs> Every time I talk, I really get really sicked out. I'm not, yeah. I can just tell with some people that something's not quite right. I mean, or maybe anybody can, but I think that I'm, I might be a little more perceptive than some people. But anytime Brian Morris talks, I really, I, I want him to like leave. You know, it's, it's not the kind of feeling where, you know, even, there's a lot of angry and creepy people that I at least just, I'll hear them out. Yeah. Brian Morris is one of the ones I, I want him to get out now. Yeah. yeah. Feeling wanting him to stay in the room where he's at. And there's not really, I don't know if you've watched him a lot in interviews, but I have. It's very much like an angry lecture of just telling you what to think about cutting. And if you get in with anything else, it's like that that's an activist propaganda or, you know, he'll find some way to make you feel or look foolish for your point mm -hmm. because he's really there just to lecture about how great cutting is. Yeah. He's not looking for other information on the issue. And he's just a very, very evil man. And, you know, there's people like that, that you know that they're are not good yeah. and you don't really know where it all comes from, that there's indications that there's a very evil side of this and mm -hmm. that there's, they might be, banding with those people yeah yeah you know whenever brendan brian morris comes up or a paper that someone put you know post to try to defend the cutting and it's you know it's written by brian morris it's like you know if you watch the american circumcision documentary they're the part where brian morris says that touch is not that important to sex and I'm like that right there should be enough to just say okay anything written by him shouldn't be considered <laughs> right did I mean, you see the interview 
Yeah. 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 There's an interview where they kick him out of the interview because they're they thought that what he was saying was ridiculous. I don't know if you've uh-huh. ever watched that one. No, I don't think but I it's have. it's one of the videos that I wish that all activists would watch because it's pretty amusing because the points that he's making, I think I think that it was that he was calling circumcision a vaccine and the host mm-hmm. finally just had enough. He was like, You cannot call that a vaccine. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And they finally got him out of the interview and they were pretty cold to him about it too, and they saw how ridiculous his points were, and they just made him exit the interview, and they didn't show him again. Yeah, but they, when people are listening to his points, anybody with a sane, sound mind would be like, "Wait, this isn't normal, and this isn't really an interview, and he's not doing back and forth with this information, and the points that he's making don't make sense, and they might just lose their patience and kick him out, and that's what they did." Yeah. Wow. Okay. I- I've, I've watched some videos on him, but I, I really don't. Really I don't know, <laughs> but this is something that I think you should at least watch that one. Okay, I'll share I, it. I would, because I think it's it's interesting to see that people have lost patience with him. Yeah, that's something we should know. But okay, yeah, I, there is a uh, a video on Intacted Wiki about him, and it, uh, yeah. So, anyways, that would be interesting. Uh, doctor patient relationships. Do you, uh, for me, I can't have a doctor that uh, supports or, or um, condones this practice at all. Uh, how about you? My current doctor, I have heard, is against the practice and maybe at one time did perform them, but I know he no longer does. So that's helpful. I don't know how easily I could find someone against the procedure here. I may be just out of luck if I wanted to find someone that was against the procedure, but I am fortunate that the person that I'm with is, but I, I don't know that that's really an easy thing to find here. I, when I was looking for things to do to restore, I asked one nurse once about, I do know that it exists, but I, I don't have any myself and I know it can be ordered where if you want like more foreskin, there's gels that'll make it grow out. And I asked a nurse about it once and she just looked at me like I was gross to even ask something like that. Like, like, like frowning, looking you face. And that made me really uncomfortable, but that wasn't my current doctor. So it depends where you go and what you ask maybe, but that I, that doctor among many reasons, I, I don't want to return to him, but my current one seems okay. Yeah, if a woman came in and asked, I said something. Well, you know, I feel like my vagina is too tight, or something like that. Is there something I can do about that? Do you think that they would respond that way to them? No, I'm under the impression that nurse probably cut her kids and just never really saw that as a thing that someone would care about, and gave her really a, a weird pause and weirded out by it. But I didn't like the way she looked at me after that, and. It definitely showed me that, you know, nurses can be unhelpful in this kind of situation. I think it's important to ask, but don't expect to always get a polite response. Some of them are pretty rude and stupid about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um, Friends and family, you've already discussed this quite a bit. You seem to have a very stressed relationship with, uh, with friends and family particularly ones that um, support or promote or condone uh, genital cutting, um, non, non-therapeutic, non-consensual genital cutting of children. Do you have any other thoughts on that topic? About my friends and family, whether they're against it or not? No, about your relationship. Is, is your relationship strained with friends and or family uh, because genital cutting happens and you're against it. How do I, where do I go with that? It's definitely come up. They're not blind. And I don't control the way Facebook works. If I comment on stuff, they might see it. Mm-hmm. That's not really my intent, but that's just the way Facebook works. Well, I'm not necessarily so talking about Facebook friends and family. I'm talking about friends and family period. It's you're talking about be... close people around me. Yeah, doesn't that have to be social media? It's forced it to be a conversation with coworkers, with close friends, mm-hmm. and I've 
learned that more people are against it than and more supportive of me against it than I might have expected. But there's also, you know, people in the community that don't quite understand why it's such a big issue. It's I actually made something, but it, it's not even my footage. I just edited somebody else's footage. And that was part of the reason why. And I made like a 15 minute little documentary and it showed like the emotional aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And I really, I encouraged people on my feed just to watch all of it because it showed how hurt people really are with the process. And it's not something that people really considered before. They just think, Oh, parent joys, parent joys. But if you look at how angry and, and sad and hurt people are from the procedure, that's not the aspect that people normally look at either. But there's, it's easy to, you know, become an activist and not really have any friends left, but I don't really have a lot of, you know, newly pregnant friends on my stuff where they, if they had kids, they had them like a long time ago. A lot of them, mm -hmm. a lot of the people on my friends are an activist and, you know, this is, I live in a small town where there's not many people I like in the first place. So it's, I wish I could tell you I had lots of friends here, but this is a small town and it's, it's hard for me to like anybody here. It's hard to get anybody yeah, they're all like family oriented. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, okay. So the next section is about female genital mutilation. Sure. Um, and the the reason why I have it in here is uh, and it, there's female circumcision too. It's kind of like a one to five ratio of females that are cut, um, circumcised, or cut or whatever, to uh, how many men in the world are are generally cut as children but uh some of us a lot of us think that uh female genital cutting will continue as long as male genital cutting goes on because the, it's the same excuses that are used for both and uh and female genital cutting uh only occurs in cultures that also cut uh, male uh, males so you have any thoughts about that yourself I have come across a lot of people acting like female is worse than male as far as cutting goes. And mm -hmm. I've had to drill into people's minds that actually both are very, very bad. You shouldn't act like one is okay and the other one isn't. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of arguments and a lot of conversation about that. I, there's a graph that I use that show all the different types. And if you do look at the graph, it'll indicate that actually the most common female cutting is actually far less invasive and far less removed than the mm -hmm. common male cutting. Yeah. And a lot of people, really, there is no MGM, you know, it's only towards female and that, you know, with male, it's beneficial. But, you know, you look at the data and you look at the charts and you look at what it is versus female and you realize that actually a whole lot more is removed from male and it's really not better. Yeah. got to see them both as wrong or never going to get anywhere but yeah. you know a lot of people think that because it's already happening must mean that it's okay oh and since the doctor's doing it, it must be okay well no actually it's not okay and it was never okay and yeah. the more people speak out about it the i i firmly believe you know there's a lot of frustration with activism and oh how many babies are we saving and then that will See, that's the thing. It's not really about saving every baby to me. It's that you can't be unopposed to this issue. They can't just keep going, cutting every baby they want and not have anybody speak out and be like, actually, that's really messed up and not necessary. And I wish every one of those people that were cutting had at least one person held them that. You know, you got to have somebody speaking up and say, actually, you didn't really need to be doing that. And actually, it's a lot worse than you think that it is. Yeah. It's not just about saving. It can't be an unopposed issue. But okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> and the very last section uh, that I cover is about social productivity. And uh, the thoughts here are that if this general cutting thing wasn't going on in the world, then, for instance, doctors uh, or moils or whatever, instead of spending time cutting children's genitalia without uh, as a non therapeutic action, they'd be spending time saying, solving cancer, something else, something else that's uh, productive and, and good. And there's also intactivists, genital autonomy advocates like you and I, that are doing 
this or, you know, go out there trying to educate people and spending hours and hours of our time trying to um, educate people about the harms instead of, I don't know, building cars or, <laughs> or entertaining people or something like that. Do you have any thoughts on that? About the productivity of an activist or the productivity of doctors? Product productivity of both um, or anyone else, uh, productivity in the world, um, that you know, humans would be more productive if we weren't spending our time and energies um, dealing with this general cutting um, that's going on in the world. I used to do an activism for hours every day. I would do the searching, I would do the memes, I put stuff anywhere and everywhere. And I eventually got to a point where I no longer felt like I could devote that kind of time to it and just grew too frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something that could take up a lot of our time if we wanted to. And maybe not even if we wanted to, but just as sort of a sense of duty because we need information out there. There's certainly more time that can be spent doing other things if we get really sucked into it. Yeah. And I've... You know, I've gotten really deep into it and I've had to pull myself out just thinking that I, I don't have that kind anymore. I've had to get myself in a mentally more healthy place or have other priorities in my life. And you know, it's, I wish I could, do, I wish I could be two different people and one of them be just fully focused on an activism, but I just don't feel like I have that kind of time anymore. I, I can't, I would just go crazy, you know, or, or any, or just not spend time on things I need to be spending time on. At the yeah. very least, but there's definitely a sense that you know we could spend time doing other things, but there's also the sense of you know we're letting something go wrong in the world that people need mm -hmm. to speak out about, and how do we just let that go on? Yeah. So you can let horrible things happen, or we can speak up about it, and neither way is really good because we're spending time on something that should never have been an issue in the first place, mm -hmm. or we can just you know, live a healthy life and not think about things like that. And I think that's where, you know, a lot of, it drives me crazy. The moms that say I'm against cutting, but even I won't say to another mom, you know, not to do that. Well, then that's just middle of the road garbage. You know, you're the one that can say that there's nothing going wrong with your kid and that it's not necessary, but you don't want to say that because you don't want to step on anyone's toes. And those kinds of things just drive me crazy. Those are the people that need to be shouting the rooftops. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with my kid and I didn't do it. You yeah. don't have to, but they're going to just, Oh, I, I can't say that because it's, it's parent choice. But even that is affecting because it was never a parent choice to begin with. It's disgusting. Even when anyone considers it a parent choice, it's horrible. Okay. To consider it a parent choice. Yeah. And any time anybody wants to tell me it's a parent choice, I'd be like, no, I should have been in charge of my body. That's wrong. And that's messed up. Yeah. You really, I didn't deserve my body just because my parents got decided that they can cut something off. I mean, that's disgusting. You're disgusting. You don't mm -hmm. get to tell me that and have me just sit by and say, oh, that's that's normal thinking. It's not normal thinking. That's completely illogical. And it's telling me that I'm I'm less than a human being because somebody could cut something off me when I'm a helpless baby. I don't go along with that. I don't just go along with that and be like, yeah, that's okay. That's not okay. It's, I don't I don't agree with that. I'm not going to go along with it. I deserve more than somebody cutting something off just as soon as they felt like it. Agreed. Yeah, it, so you're, you're discussing uh, intactivist uh, burnout, and uh, it's it's very very common. Uh, that's led to lots of interviews this week for me, and uh, and even next week, because uh, I I made a post saying, hey, uh, you know, I'm looking for burnt out intactivists to to have uh, conversations with, and um, and there's a lot of them out there, um, a lot of us that uh, get burnt out, and I I. Burnt out in some ways too myself. I I find different ways to try to educate people and everything like that without um, going head on all the time with people and getting into the debates and stuff like that. Sometimes just dropping information or creating videos like this or uh, creating TikTok videos or, or whatever something different that uh, still feels good. Like I'm I'm doing something to change things, but without getting into the the debate all the time. And dealing with the cognitive dissonance that goes on up there. So.
So uh, that pretty much wraps up the whole list. Is there any uh, any other points that you'd like to share with the world about this topic? There's probably tons of stuff. I don't know how to narrow it down. I suppose if I could say one thing, I would just that I deserve to keep my body and how dare anybody else say that it's a parent choice. I deserve to keep my body and that that's messed up and that's wrong. I shouldn't have had to spend three years restoring for something that I should have been able to keep in the first place to only somewhat undo the damage. It was very sick and wrong. If my parents were doing it, I don't forgive anybody else that's done it. Yeah. It's a horrible, horrible practice that I don't I don't condone or go along with. I'm very against the practice and I'll speak out about that as widely as I can because I I need people to speak that it's not a normal or good thing and about it as I can so that people can open their eyes with it and I'll, I'll do what I can with it. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, even the inactivists that don't want to be confrontational, you know, put the put info memes at, um, at the top of your profile, you know, their featured photos that way people that look at your profile can see it and you don't even have to confront them with it it's just people that look at your profile there's ways to do it in a non-confrontational way and start with you know info memes on your featured photos start with things that you can do because it needs to be a conversation we have to talk about this we can't bury the truth of this anymore it's it's something that's gone too far too out of hand and only more recently people are realizing just how messed up it is and we need to take the foothold and run with it and show people just how bad it really is and how unnecessary it really is. And against the parents, new moms, not be afraid to talk to them about it or give them info cards or send them information or whatever else we got to do. And hopefully they can reconsider that they really don't need to be doing that. And that, you know, if they are going to do it, you know that they're on the wrong side of history because people are more and more against it now. Yeah. And then they're going to be very alone with their belief with that because people are not happy about it anymore. Yeah. And they're not going along with it anymore. People are losing mad respect for their friends now for doing it after they're already been given the information about it. It's very frowned upon now, much more than it was before. Yeah. People lose family and lose friends and lose their closest friend of 20 years, like left and right. They go ahead and cut anyway. They just cut them out of their life. It's not, it's just considered torture and child abuse after you already know the information to do it anyway. People don't have any sympathy for somebody like that. They just want the person to go away. I, I could have the closest friend in the world, but if they went ahead and did it anyway, I wouldn't probably want anything to do with that person. If they were given the information, I have no sympathy for that person. Yeah. Okay, David. Well, um, thank you so much for this interview, and thank you for your advocacy work that you do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I couldn't stop now, even if I want to, you know. But just whatever I can do for the cause, I make sure to do it. Okay. Great. Well, have a great evening. Thank you again for your time. All right. Thank you. See you. Okay.